Hey guys, Catfish KC, this is Nick here. Uh, we're bringing you part three of this bait tank build. This is really actually just a tips and tricks and kind of an update from what I've learned over the last six months from having this bait tank. Uh, I had to make some modifications initially over here uh, on the side just because of uh, some problems we ran into. Uh, we got a little helper today. This is Athena, 55 pounds of muscle today. Um, so a couple of things we're going to talk about are those modifications. We're going to talk about aeration. We're going to talk about the biofilter. We're going to talk about water quality and the issues and diseases that fish get because of water quality issues. And maybe some common questions that people get when they're uh, looking to start a bait tank and have running into some initial problems. So let's get started. Okay, so the first thing uh, that we did was initially we had to upgrade from a three quarter inch PVC up to one and a half inch PVC for the overflow uh, right over here. And uh, we also had to make some modifications down below. So I'll show you that. I bought uh, two Fernco fittings. You can get everything at Home Depot. I'll try to leave links in the description. Uh, a two inch down to one and a half and then a one and a half down to one and a quarter. And then I just took a PVC kind of hard to see but I took a PVC uh, one and a quarter end cap with a uh, uh, a fitting here and screwed on a three quarter inch elbow here connected to this uh, regular garden hose. The other thing you want is good aeration in this system so uh, what we're really looking for when it comes to aeration are the smaller bubbles that dissolve that oxygen into the water right and I have a Venturi system set up right here. The way I have it set up now is the water flow comes through here, it goes down the T, and it pulls oxygen and bubbles through the pin down to the bottom and they, they, they rise up. We're really looking for those smaller bubbles, but sometimes we get the bigger ones from there, it's okay. I have a, uh, an additional pump and aerator at the bottom here. To, to help out with that. And I don't run it all the time, the aerator. Sometimes I run it for just an hour or two every now and then. It doesn't hurt to run it all the time, but I just don't. You can do what you want. So I also have, right now, I have the system turned off for recording purposes. Otherwise it'd be really loud in here, but I'm gonna show you at the end of the video. So stick to the end. I'll show you what it looks like turned on and fully running. Okay, the next thing we're talking about is the biofilter. Now the biofilter is the heart of the tank. That's where all of the fish waste, all the poop, ammonia, gets turned into nitrates via the nitrogen cycle. So what happens is the, you feed the fish, fish turn that into waste, which is ammonia. We have bacteria that build up uh, and grow and, and, and feed off of that ammonia. That's their food source. They turn that ammonia into the nitrites. From there, we have another new additional bacteria that grows and forms. And that feeds off of the nitrites and turns that into nitrates. Now both ammonia and nitrites are extremely harmful to fish. They're very deadly. They will kill fish pretty quickly if you don't reduce those levels. And you can do that a uh, couple different ways. You can do that by building a biofilter, which we're going to show you, or you can do that by doing water changes. Now, if you don't have a biofilter and you just have a tank, uh, if you have just a few fish in there, those ammonia levels are going to reach pretty high pretty quickly. So you, it's almost essential to have a biofilter. So in this biofilter, you have a couple components here. You have uh, mechanical filtration right here. So the mechanical filtration, what this does is it fi filters out all of the larger particles. And this comes straight from that uh, gravity setup down there through the valve. What I have in the tank at the bottom there is a uh, mesh screen and so these are 200 micron filter socks you can get these on amazon i think they're uh 13 14 dollars for a two pack uh 200 microns this will filter out all the large particles so if you look in there i don't know it's kind of hard to see but uh it's pretty it's pretty gross in there there's some pretty pretty big uh poopy particles in there. That's what we'll call them, poopy particles. Once these things fill up with waste and they start overflowing, you can wait till they start getting full, or in my case, since I'm in a basement, I wait till they start smelling, and which is usually about two weeks. And then I take these, 
flip them inside out, throw it in the washing machine with a couple catfuls of bleach, and you are good to go. Uh, let it dry out for about 48 hours before reintroducing it. So really what I have is I have four of these, so whenever I go to wash these, I just replace them with another two and then on and on. So once you get past your mechanical filtration, what you have is your biofiltration here. Now this is where all of that bacteria sits there and grows and turns that ammonia into nitrites and then into nitrates, which are less harmful to fish. Um, nitrates are less harmful to fish. However, in larger quantities, they are harmful and deadly. But what I'm trying to do is introduce some plants to the system because what plants do their root system actually loves nitrates and they actually filter out the nitrates and uh, turn that into clean water for the fish now the problem i'm having is every time we get some roots growing which they are the fish actually come and nibble on them and uh, eat those roots so we're going to have to devise a system that holds these in place and kind of guards it from the fish temporarily. Back to this. So the biofiltration here, what you have are these little scrubbies. You can get any sort of plastic caps, uh, any anything plastic, PVC pieces. Um, these are just little regular uh, pot scrubbers from the store there. And at the bottom there, I'll give you a little, down here, I have, this is pumice rock. You can get lava rock, pumice rock, anything really porous -y is what you want down there for that good bacteria to just sit on. They sit in these really porous environments and you want them to sit there and thrive. I chose pumice rock because pumice rock is one of the most porous rocks on the planet and has the highest surface area of uh, uh, pores. I also have lava rock. I also have PVC down there. Uh, little things, anything plastic really to get you, get your good bacteria growing on there. So that is our bio filter set up there. Now you can build this any number of ways. Matt, uh, Matt has another video where he built a basically at home uh, FX six filter, which is a canister filter. Um, and it's a, it's a little different. I went with this system because these are very easy to clean. It re, it's minimal maintenance on this system. Uh, because this filters out all the large debris, I rarely have to go in and mess with any of the biofilter. However, every now and then, I will pull them out, a couple bags, and just kind of give them a good shake in a, a bucket of filtered water. Uh, you don't want any chlorine or anything in there that'll kill that good bacteria. Give them a good shake because they do start to build up with this uh, dark filmy slime and that can clog the pores and then your filtration and bacteria go levels go down. So you do want to keep that uh, surface clean as well. Okay, so some of the extra things I added, a couple things, I got two, I got two Jaeger uh, heaters. These are each 300 watts, one there and one here. And I have my tank set to about 68 degrees right now. I had it at 74. You can just get a little temperature reader and a probe. 69, actually, 0.5. And then the other thing I added was this uh, pump right here. That is a 1600 gallon per hour pump. I originally was going to get a, I was going to upgrade the biofilter pump from an 800 gallon per hour that's in there to a 1200 but decided instead I would like to go with an additional pump in here. And what this did was kind of give it some circulation. It actually uh, circulates and any particles that are floating on top get dispensed with right there through the overflow. And then uh, I try to have it in a, a flowing in a way where all the waste kind of sits right there and kind of gets sucked up through that bottom filter. Now, right now I don't have the system plugged in because it's pretty loud and you wouldn't be able to hear me. So we've got a lot of uh, waste and debris down there, kind of just sitting there. But uh, I'll show you here towards the end when we get everything plugged in 
turned on. Okay, now I'm gonna show you the three things that I put in the system for externally. I only introduced three external sources into the system other than fish. Food, salt, sea salt by the way, and medicine. Now let's start with the salt. The salt goes along with the water heaters. They run in tandem because anytime uh, we have fluctuations in water temperature, if we have quick fluctuations that are pretty high or low, five, 10 degrees, those fish can start to die off. They don't like to be shocked like that. So when you're introducing new fish to the system, especially different times during the year, what you wanna do is take this heater, put it in your five gallon bucket or whatever you brought the new fish home into. And if you purge them, you do that for 24 hours or whatever, do your thing. I don't purge them any longer just because I actually lose more fish when I purge them. They end up dying. Uh, because of the ammonia buildup in a smaller five gallon bucket or something. So what I do is I take the heater and I get the, the water temperature of the bucket within about two or three degrees of the water temperature of my main tank here. And then I introduce those fish after a little while, just so they're not shocked. You bring the temperature up gradually over time. Uh, now the salt is introduced when you do water changes and that helps to regulate their slime coat and helps build a new slime coat for them because uh, what the salt does is it strips away their slime coat and it's kind of an immune system builder. You're kind of exposing them to things and it builds their immune system back up. As well as whenever you do a water change, it kind of keeps them a little bit more regulated and more comfortable. The other thing about salt is that it's a natural disinfectant. You know, civilizations have been using it for years to heal things, heal wounds and different things. So a lot of the problems that you get with fish, any sort of diseases, fin, tail rot, those kinds of things, those mainly come from water quality issues. Now what happens is sometimes you introduce new fish into the system, they could be carrying those and they spread it. They're bait fish, they're not, a, you know, they're not pet, so we're not worried too much. However, we do want to keep them healthy. So what the salt does is it actually uh, kills a lot of the fungi and bacteria that's in the tank. Uh, as well as some of the sores and things that they develop on their skin and helps, like I said, helps them rebuild their immune system kind of and fight that stuff. So uh, sometimes what you do is if you have like a case of fin and tail rot, let's say, you're going to raise that water temperature to about 80, 85 degrees, somewhere in between there. It's pretty high, actually. It's warm and uh, introduce uh, a ratio of salt to your system for about a week and then bring those levels back down, temperature and salt levels back down. And what that does is it kills off some of the, uh, the skin flukes and some of the sores they have on their body, as well as some of the fungus and, and rot that they have going on. Now, what a lot of people do is they actually uh, take the diseased fish and put that into what's called a quarantine tank and they go that way. But generally, if I have that, a lot of my fish end up having that on them as well. So I do the whole system. So the water quality is very essential to keeping your fish healthy. In fact, that is the number one important thing, keeping your fish healthy. And everything that we've talked about has to do with water quality. Heaters, salt, the biofilter being the most important. Fresh water, doing your regular water changes when needed. Um, what you can do is go get some strip, strips, some test strips. API makes some, other companies make them. They're relatively cheap. and. Uh, while you're starting out, kind of getting used to read the levels and kind of reading things, you want to watch your ammonia nitrate levels and your nitrates. But uh, after your nitrates get to a certain level, what you want to do is do a water change. So what I do is on these IBC totes, they actually have indicators for the gallons. I don't know if you can see that. We got 150 here, 125. Really what I do is I empty out about one square. So about... Mm, 75 gallons or so sometimes and uh, what that does is it reintroduces fresh water into the system gets rid pulls those nitrate levels down um, because they aren't as dangerous to the fish you can actually pull them down and they won't rise up quickly either kind of rise up slowly as long as you're not feeding them regularly um, what you want to do is feed your fish about once or twice a week it's really up to you but the more you feed them, the more you gotta change these, and the more you have to do water changes because those levels really get high. 
So I feed mine about once or twice a week, really just to keep that active bacteria and that good bacteria thriving and uh, growing. All right, so for the medicine, I put it in there, but it's really not that important. Here's the deal, I got this Melafix, it was not cheap. I mean, it says it's for like koi fish and goldfish, whatever, but <clears throat> it's to cure fin and tail rot. <laughs> Doesn't work with a darn, I feel like. So the salt works way better than that. Increase the temperature, raise it up, add some salt. Now this is 200 gallons. And I figured out there, there is a certain ratio you have to have. For 200 gallons, it's a little under, just below five pounds of salt. So I get these salt, pure sea salt, get that at Costco. It's like two bucks or something for this. And this is uh, 30 ounces, so that's almost two pounds. So two, two and a half of these, uh, a little less than two and a half, gets me. I don't have to do that very often. Now it comes to food, what I ended up doing was switching over to these fly grubs. You can get a pound of this, I'll put a link in the description below, you can get a pound of this for I believe 11, 12 bucks. Um, and what these are are just fly grubs, they're just mealworms. What I was using before were these shrimp pellets. These things, they tear them up, they love them. However, they are extremely messy. They're just little pellets. And what they do is they, they turn the water brown and just, instead of chunks getting everywhere, it leaves dust everywhere. So it just muddies the water really bad and it makes it stink really bad in here. So these fly grubs, mealworms, whatever you want to call them, they're just regular mealworms, let me see. Dry it up. So let's show you what it looks like when they feed. Because these guys, these guys are savages, especially these rock bass. I'll show you this. The other reason I went with these mealworms is because they float. They actually don't sink. So whatever doesn't get used still floats here and it uh, really gets drained. But generally these guys are pretty hungry and they tear it up pretty good. If I turn this light off above, there they go. Now they all come out of hiding. They really don't like that light. Those rock bass especially are savages. They tear up anything they come in contact with. <laughs> but you can kind of see these little tiny particles, these little floating particles. Now these are what I'm talking about. These are the ones that go straight down there. You don't have to worry about them floating around forever. Everything else goes right through the drain down the bottom. And I did put a mesh screen down there so that no fish can get through if they die or want to hide. Because the problem is they, they like to sit they like to sit down there and sleep down there and they get sucked through and then you end up getting clogged and have to take that off that fern co fitting um, and drain it that way so put a little mess screen down there you don't got to worry about it now the problem i have to do with this one is that it's actually too small and some of their poop is too big to fit through there so i'm gonna have to upgrade that uh, the other aesthetics that i have in here are just a little you know a little piece of wood pottery down there just for them to hang out with and then uh this little pvc pipe just to move things around forgot to mention the other thing you want to get is some water conditioner this is safe made by sea chem i recommend this stuff you have to be very careful with it though because it's very concentrated extremely concentrated a lot of people use prime sea chem prime i've used it it's great but I found that I just ran out quickly. You put a few catfuls in, it's gone. This stuff, I'm not joking when I say it's powerful. This stuff you add a quarter of a teaspoon to 300 gallons. So this stuff will last you like 
five, 10 years, plenty of time. Uh, if you don't have a water filter prior to doing a water change, a lot of people just take five gallon buckets, fill them up and you gotta wait 24 hours or so for all the chlorine to dissipate and evaporate out of there. Chlorine, chloramine, um, as well as some of the other things that the tap water puts in. If you have well water, you can put that straight in. Uh, but if you're using <clears throat> water from the main, main water line, you're gonna have to wait 24 hours or get yourself a filter. So this is an RV filter, put this in part two, but this will filter out about, I think it's 2000 or 2500 gallons before you have to replace it. That filters out all the chloramine. So you can just hook it straight up to a hose, fill your tank up. And I do the same thing in reverse when I'm actually uh, doing a water change. I just put the hose in there, lift up the hose a little bit, still it starts flowing and it creates a siphon, and then you can kind of scoot that around the water and pick up any debris that's sitting around and do your water change that way. I'm gonna show you now what it looks like once we uh, turn the system on. Okay, so what we're gonna do first is show you what this looks like. Let me show you plug in here. And now you can kind of see what I'm talking about with that Venturi and the bubbles that it it's up. Now what we want, like I said, are those small bubbles. And you have to really look hard, but they are there. They come up very tightly and you have to see really just the surface that kind of pop. But I'll show you what it looks like here with this one. When I plug this aerator in down there, it actually gets pumped through the other pump there. It gets shot out through the pump and uh, ends up turning into really fine bubbles. Okay, this is what that looks like. Okay, we can see the actually all the bubbles get pumped this way. And if you really, really look, you can see a there's really fine bubbles coming up. Really tiny ones. Those are the ones we're looking for. Man, these guys are going crazy. Man. And now that the system's turned on, sorry for the noise, you can see that it's actually overflowing there. I'm gonna open this. There we go. And now we got it flowing through there as well. Just for your information, I'm gonna give you a little, a little science lesson about, uh, I don't know, physics, gravity, whatever this is. What I thought was all of the pressure and the volume of 200 gallons would make this stream out really fast. What I didn't know was that water will not, gravity doesn't force that. It doesn't matter about the volume of the container, it matters about the height. So it doesn't matter that there's 200 gallons right here pushing through there, that hose. If I lift this hose higher than the level of the actual tank, it stops flowing. As soon as that level goes below, it starts flowing again. Interesting to know. So this is the system flowing. It's draining through both overflow in the bottom gravity also aerating at the same time. Thanks for watching guys, that was the system. Don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe, and if you have any questions, comment below, or uh, comment below if you can give me any suggestion, suggestions on how to get this to uh, take, or a structure I can build or design or something where this can grow, the roots can grow, and the fish not attack it. Thanks guys, we'll see you next time.